So who likes a mystery novel? I was just talking with my, with my uh, kids about uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, murder, murder in the Rome Rue Morgue, Rome Morgue. <laughs> August Dupin, I can't say any French names, so I won't say any more. I won't, Agatha Christie and uh, Hercule Poirot, yeah. Anyways, in recent years, the, the, the like true crime genre has, has taken off and people listen to podcasts about people getting, getting murdered and stuff. It's probably a little grim and probably I shouldn't have listened to so many things, but uh, it's, it, it, it like strikes us when we think like who is to blame here? By the way, it's always the husband. Like the whole husband is dead. But like, the wife disappears, it's always the husband. Sorry. So today we're going to try our hand at the detective genre and unwind the story. Who is responsible for the death of Jesus Christ? So. We'll introduce, I'll introduce you to the suspects. We have suspect number one at the top of the list. We have Pontius Pilate. He is a Roman. Jesus died on a Roman cross. And here we have him. Secondly, we have the chief priests. The chief priests, the religious leaders who plotted against Jesus. Thirdly, we have the 1975 Philadelphia Flyers, <laughs> known as the Broad Street Bullies, and by their actions, tripled the NHL rulebook. Third, fourth, <laughs> we have the rulers of the people, probably including the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. Fifth, we have the people, the people who shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And perhaps we will even throw in a mystery suspect near the end. So with that, let us pray and the game is afoot. Lord God, we pray that you would lead us by your power. Teach us, teach us to understand your word rightly, that we would see you and the purpose for which you came to earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Was it Pilate? So we're going to look at Pilate first. After all, Jesus died on a Roman cross. Jewish, Jewish executions were by stoning, and the soldiers guarding Jesus, guarding the tomb, were Roman soldiers. And if I were in court, I would have a paper to be like, who signed this execution notice? And the name would be Pontius Pilate. In this text, we see Pilate presiding over the Roman trial. And there are seven stages of a Roman trial. First is the arrest, which is here. You brought me this man. So Jesus was arrested, brought into custody. Secondly, is the charge. And the charge against Jesus reads, he was misleading the people. He's brought as one misleading the people, literally changing the customs, being different or odd, almost you could translate it, which in the ancient world, just being different or odd was enough to get you arrested. Three, we have the uh, the cognito of the trial, which is in Latin, but it's the weighing of the evidence, the part where they examine what is going on. And he says, he examined him before you. And this is in the uh, first 12 verses of chapter 23. And then four, we will get the verdict. And the verdict is, I do not find this man, Jesus, guilty of any of your charges against him. Now, if we're going to try to stick this on Pilate, it's going to be kind of hard when he keeps saying that Jesus is innocent. The fifth is the, uh, it's kind of like a, an appeal or the second verdict, an appeal to Herod by 
Neither did Herod find him guilty, for he sent him back to us, which is the supporting verdict. And then six is the acquittal. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Jesus is innocent, as we talked the whole sermon on last week. And then finally, the judicial warning, because if you got arrested by the Romans, they, it's not like they're going to just like pat you on the back and let you go. They're going to at least beat you because, you know, you caused them enough hassle to have to draw the attention. So he says, I will punish and release him. And the word punish here, it's for beating. It could be as bad as like the scourging which Jesus is going to get, which is horrible. But it's probably just, you know, just beaten by rods which is probably worse than anything that we've ever experienced. You know, thin rods and just getting like whacked by these things. Like it didn't break your bones, but it hurt a lot. And, and by a pilot, it's like, I'll just, we'll just beat him and let him go. Pilate kept saying that Jesus was innocent. Verse 20, Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And the third time, he says it three times, he said, why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. Therefore, I will punish and release him. Pilate, like the mama in Merle Haggard's song, he tried, he tried. But in the end, he gives way to the crowd. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided their demand should be granted. Pilate tried to release Jesus, and if you were, if I was trying to defend him, he'd be like, Pilate really tried here. He tried again and again, and his hands were kind of tied. His hands were tied, his hands were washed, and eventually he let Jesus go. Well, he tried to let Jesus go, but had no choice. So, before blaming Pilate too quickly, let's keep looking at our other suspects. The chief priests. Now, the chief priests not only were there accusing Jesus, but we have some evidence that this plot goes back quite a bit further. In verse chapter 22, the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. They didn't put them on the sand and be like, did you guys, were you guys plotting to kill Jesus? And they would have to, well, yeah, we were. Seems awful suspicious. Pilate may have signed the form, but they conspired against him. And the mob that shouted and cried out, who stirred them up? But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have them release for them Barabbas instead. So, chief priests, were you not satisfied with shedding the blood of bulls and goats, but you had to shed the blood of this innocent man? Maybe. The 1975 Philadelphia Flyers. <laughs> they were bad. Well, they were good hockey players, sort of, depending upon how you define hockey. And they need Jesus. But unfortunately, there's no evidence that they were around during Jesus' trial. <laughs> And so we get to the rulers. The rulers were, were probably made up of some fat Pharisees and, and people of the council and important people in Jerusalem. And if you want to like get an angle on this, if you want to understand people's motivations, where are people's motivations? Do you follow the, you follow the money? You follow the power? Maybe you follow some other things? And so did they have a motive? To kill Jesus? Well, actually, if we look at John, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do for this man performs many signs? 
And if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So follow the money, follow the power if you want to solve the case. Who had the motive to kill Jesus? It was the rulers who didn't want this Galilee teacher distracting the people from their power. Maybe calling their power to account. They were the ones who had the most to gain for Jesus being out of the way. But then again, the rulers and chief priests, these make up a small amount of people. And who was it that shouted down Pilate as he sat on his judgment seat? Who was so loud? That was the crowd, the mob. In fact, it calls them, not just a crowd, not just a select mob, but the people, called together chief priests, the rulers, and the people together. And so this was a, a cross-section of Jerusalem. We, we might not say it's like the same crowd that welcomed Jesus as he rode in on the donkey with hails of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but there is some significant crossover between these groups of people. There are certainly some people who hailed Jesus as the Messiah, but as soon as the tides turned, they were willing to shout, crucify him, crucify him. Now, they shouted these words, crucify him, crucify him. And... We, we have a cross up here, and, and we get used to the cross. You know, we wear it as jewelry, but, but we, we just don't feel like we should if we're reading the Bible. Because the cross, like I, I always try to describe the cross, is the cross is not an execution device, but it's a torture device that happens to kill you. It's like they're shouting, torture him for hours and days until he is dead. But they're shouting for the horrific mutilation of human being here. The cross was so awful a device that a Roman citizen was not allowed to be crucified. In fact, like for a while they didn't crucify anybody except for slaves. Like the most famous times when they crucified people is during like the great the great slave revolt uh which is a little bit before the time of christ but the like i am spartacus you know that one like the big slave revolt all of those guys two thousand people they cru crucified them all because they were slaves and they didn't think much of slaves they didn't think of human dignity they didn't know people were created in the image of god like we learned in sunday school class It's hard to imagine, you know, wishing for the maximum amount of pain being inflicted upon someone, but this is what the people do. This is what the crowd shouts. Crucify him. Torture him for as long as it takes for him to die. The people shouted for blood. And ultimately, when it says he released them, he released the man who had been thrown in prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus, literally says, over to their will. The pilot like, gave them over to what they wanted, gave them over to their will. Mm. Even Peter, Peter the Apostle, when he's preaching later in the book of Acts, reflecting upon how Jesus died. He does not point primarily to Pilate, but he calls all the people to account. He says, but you, speaking to the crowd in the temple, denying the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you, all of the people, kill the author of life whom God raised from the dead. They deny Jesus who is holy and righteous. And I think about how bad it feels when someone like 
doesn't recognize some good I've done and think that something I tried to be good is, is bad and I'm like getting criticized for it and I'm like, <sighs> and that's me and I've done a lot of bad things. Like I deserve a fair amount of criticism all the time. But Jesus deserves no criticism. They deny him and instead ask for a murderer. They ask for a murderer. They would rather have someone who ends life than the one who gives his life for others. And they barely, so poetic, they killed the author of life. They killed God. They killed the one who literally gave breath to their lungs. They sent the one who is the way, the truth, and the life on the way to a terrible and destructive death. The people. Now, I think to make our investigation complete, we have to investigate at least two more people. And, and the other person we'll investigate is, you know, if you're going to round up the usual suspects, who are you going to round up in the death of somebody? Going to round up a murderer. Barabbas. Barabbas, he was. <laughs> A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Now it was tradition at the Passover that they would release a prisoner. This is kind of a Roman tradition during festivals. They would release people. And they don't want Jesus. Instead, they ask for Barabbas. And the word is the, his name itself might be a little important. Bar, like, like bar in, in Hebrew means son. So bar, and then Abba, bar, Abbas, Abba means father. Those might be actual words you know, they're pretty common words. And so literally they mean son of the father. And they ask for this, the son of the father, instead of the son of the father, Jesus Christ, God with us. Now, we don't know very much about Barabbas, but we can, we can guess a couple of things pretty, pretty confidently. Is that he was a rebel. He led a rebellion against Rome. Now, we can also surmise that he was a bad rebel. Not bad in the sense of like he was a, like a, like a particularly bad guy, but that he was just so sorry of a rebel that the Romans hadn't killed him right away. Like, like he was just kind of laughable in his rebellion that they hadn't, because if he was like a serious, like bad dude, they would have, he would have been gone already. And we also assume that he's guilty, if he's guilty of murder, he is not guilty of killing Romans. Because again, if he was guilty of killing Romans, he would have been on the cross already. He wouldn't have been waiting around in custody. And so, the fact that they ask for Barabbas, someone who's killed their own countrymen, and Pilate puts him up like, you know, you really don't want to release Barabbas. Like, he's like the dude nobody likes. You know, he led a rebellion and nobody showed up. Like, you don't want to release him. But instead, they ask for him. And this does, when they let Barabbas go and send Jesus to the cross, it puts Jesus in a place it said, Jesus, you are lower than the worst rebel that we can think of. You are worse than him. Barabbas walks free. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Barabbas walks free, and Jesus walks to the cross. I'd say if I was a lawyer, it'd be like, awful convenient that he walks free here. As you kind of think about it, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting thinking, you know, they had those crosses ready, they had three crosses ready, and one of those crosses was probably exactly Barabbas's cross. That was the cross that Barabbas was going to die on. And instead, he walks free. Jesus goes bearing his cross to his hill. So, who killed Jesus? Who killed Jesus? 
I mean, you can make a case for everyone. I mean, everyone's to blame in some way. But I also don't want to let, I don't want to let us off the hook. The Bible says again and again, why did Jesus die? Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus died for my sins. That every time that I have been a rebel to God's rules and God's way, every time that I have ignored what God wanted me to do, every time that I chose sin instead of God, this was a reason that Jesus Christ died. And so I can't say they're like pointing all the finger at all of these people when the reason why Jesus went to the cross just as much as any of those, just as much any of those is my sin, what I did. Now Jesus didn't ultimately die because of judicial incompetence by Pilate. He didn't ultimately die because of the scheming of the priests and the rulers and the, and the Pharisees. He didn't die because the people who shouted, crucify him, crucify him. As he says again and again, no one takes my life from me, John 10, but I lay it down for my people. Who killed Jesus? I mean, nobody killed Jesus, and I killed Jesus. Pilate killed Jesus, but ultimately Jesus died. Jesus died because of my sin. And I and you, what the wonderful treasure is, the wonderful promise is, is it just like Barabbas? who was guilty of rebellion, just like we're guilty of rebellion of God, just like Barabbas, who had a literal cross sitting on a hill, waiting for him to be tortured until dead on it, just like that I had that cross, and you had that cross. And if you trust in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe in his name, Jesus will take that cross for you. So that you need not suffer, Jesus suffered already. And we know that it's that easy. It's just like, it sounds like Jesus is going to say that just, just for that. We know it's that easy because Peter, on when he's preaching to the crowd, the literal crowd of people who were literally there shouting, crucify him, crucify him. He says, so what shall we do? And he says, very simply, repent therefore. That means turn away from your sin. I'm emotionally, I'm sorry for my sin. I grieve over it. And turn again. Turn to God. Turn to accept his gift in Jesus Christ that your sins may be blotted out. And Jesus pays for the entire penalty so that we can be right with God and live rightly for him. So for this, it's only two things. One, is that for every person we need to see, if we do not know Jesus, there is a cross of death waiting for us and we need to trust in him so that he takes it for us. And secondly, if we know that, if that's something that's old hat for us, glorify the name of Jesus all the more. You'll feel the emotion of him going to the exit, of, of Barabbas waiting to get sent to his cross Feel that emotion again of how at the last second, Jesus goes to the cross while you get to walk away. Free and more than free. Reconciled with God forever. So let's pray. Oh Lord God, we pray that we would see your work on the cross. That no, one, that no one killed you, but you went to the cross in our place, paying penalty for our sin so that we could have eternal life forever. And I pray, Lord, as much as we know that, we would glorify your name and live out that. 
that our joy of salvation would drive us and change us day by day to be more like you in every way. We thank you for how faithful you are, Lord, Lord Jesus, faithful even to the end. So we glorify your name and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.